All right, this week we're going to be taking a look at the endocrine system and the urinary system. So we'll start with the endocrine system first. This is a section of the pituitary gland, which is one of the most important endocrine glands. It hangs from the uh, floor of the hypothalamus uh, via pituitary stalk, mostly composed of the infundibulum of the pituitary. And uh, this is the main body of the pituitary, which rests on the hypophyseal fossa um, of the sphenoid bone. The pituitary is actually two glands in one, and so it's divided into anterior and posterior sections. The anterior section is called the adenohypophysis, and it actually is composed of three different structures. The main portion of the adenohypophysis, which uh, is part of the main body here, is called the pars distalis and uh, is darker, more basophilic staining portion of the pituitary gland. Um, posterior to the pars distalis, you have a small portion of the adenohypophysis, which is called the pars intermedia. It gets its name because it's sandwiched between uh, the pars distalis and the posterior pituitary. And then finally, you have the pars tuberalis, which is the more superior portion of the pituitary gland that wraps around the infundibulum as part of the pituitary stalk. So once again, we have pars tuberalis, pars intermedia, and pars distalis. The posterior pituitary is called the neurohypophysis uh, because it has a different embryological organ, and it's actually modified neural tissue, uh, which contains long axons extending from the hypothalamus through the uh, pituitary stalk and into the posterior portion of the pituitary. So the neurohypophysis, or posterior pituitary, uh, is generally lighter in color, it's less uh, basophilic and more homogeneous in appearance. So um, the major portion of the pituitary stalk is called the infundibulum because of its funnel shape. And uh, then the other part of the neurohypophysis, excuse me, the other part of the neurohypophysis is called the pars nervosa, which is this region here, which is immediately posterior to the pars uh, uh, distalis and pars intermedia. Here's another section uh, with a different angle here. You can see the pituitary stalk up here. The lighter staining region in the center is the uh, infundibulum, which is surrounded by uh, pars tuberalis on either side, where it wraps around. Here you can see pars uh, distalis, pars intermedia, and pars nervosa. Your sections, uh, most of them will not have the pituitary stock. So uh, be able to identify those structures in photographs and on the PowerPoint slides. Uh, for your particular slides, you want to focus on these three uh, parts of the pituitary, pars distalis, pars intermedia, pars nervosa. Here's a little bit higher magnification view of those three areas. And here's an even higher magnification view. Um, here is on the left, at high magnification, this is pars distalis, which you can identify uh, because it has a more clumpy or heterogeneous appearance. The pars nervosa is lighter in color and has an overall smoother appearance. Here between those two is the pars intermedia. And you can identify this structure not only based on its location, but also because of the presence of these uh, uh, clusters of structures, which are known as uh, Rathke's pouch or Rathke's cysts. Those are these pocketed like structures, which are found in the pars intermedia. This is a section of the thyroid gland. We've uh, looked at this before. The thyroid gland uh, is peculiar for uh, endocrine glands in that uh, the secretions are not immediately released into the bloodstream. First, they are uh, stored in these follicles in the form of this uh, cloudy or flocculent substance known as colloid. Colloid contains thyroglobulins. Um, uh, T3 and T4, which are the primary thyroid hormones. The epithelium of the follicles uh, is composed 
mostly of uh, simple cuboidal epithelium or sometimes simple squamous epithelium if they're more flattened out. Uh, in between the follicles, you see a lot of collagen because there's a lot of connective tissues. So you can find fibroblasts and other cells in those regions, but there's also f other functional endocrine cells. Uh, in the interfollicular spaces, you find cells. Sorry about that again. Hopefully that won't pop up again. Um, other cells in the interfollicular regions are called interfollicular or parafollicular cells, uh, such as these cells right here. These cells secrete a hormone which is known as calcitonin, which is uh, involved in regulation of blood calcium levels, uh, although it's a relatively minor function. Most calcium regulation is due to uh, parathyroid hormone, which is secreted by the parathyroid gland, which is this gland shown right here. Uh, the number of parathyroid glands uh, differs from individual to individual. Most people have between four and eight parathyroid glands. They are small glands which are located on the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland. So here you can see parathyroid gland along with some thyroid gland that's dissected out along with it. Parathyroid gland is more basophilic and uh, you can see these uh, intensely basophilic staining cords of cells. Uh, this tissue secretes a hormone known as parathyroid hormone uh, which stimulates osteoclast activity causing calcium to be released in the blood. This is a much more essential hormone for uh, calcium regulation but it's opposed by the uh, action of uh, the antagonistic hormone uh, calcitonin, which is uh, produced by interfollicular or parafollicular cells in the thyroid gland. Here is a uh, higher magnification view of the parathyroid gland and uh, observe the presence of the basophilic cords of cells. You don't need to be able to distinguish between specific types of cells in the parathyroid gland. We're not going to go into that much detail. This is a section, high magnification section of the pancreas. We've seen this one last week as part of the digestive system because of its, uh, uh, and part of it is uh, actually endocrine, exocrine tissue. Remember this uh, gland has a dual role. About 98% of the tissue is exocrine, which is composed of these serous asini. The remaining 2% of the tissue is uh, uh, endocrine in function and is fact can be found in these structures which are known as islets of Langerhans. Islets of Langerhans are composed of these uh, thin cords of cells that are vascularized and these contain different types of cells, alpha and beta cells, which produce uh, the antagonistic hormones glucagon and insulin, both of which are important for regulating uh, blood sugar levels. This is a section of kidney here as well as a gland which sits atop the kidney on the superior surface. Uh, this gland is known as a adrenal gland or uh, often it's referred to as the suprarenal gland due to its anatomical location just superior to the kidneys. Here is another section of adrenal gland where you can see uh, two functional divisions. Uh, the deep part of the gland is called the medulla and is paler in coloration. The more superficial portion of the gland is called the uh, adrenal cortex. And here's a higher magnification view of those layers. This is the adrenal medulla. This is the adrenal cortex. The cortex is uh, surrounded by a connective tissue layer here, which is, uh, forms a capsule surrounding this organ. At this high magnification, you can actually see the cortex is composed of three discrete uh, layers. The superficial most layer is known as the zona glomerulosa. And uh, if you look at even higher magnification, you can see uh, the uh, ball-like clusters or arrangement of secretory cells. These cells uh, secrete mineralocorticoids, a class of endocrine hormones that secrete, uh, that regulate uh, blood minerals such as uh, aldosterone. Uh, 
as an example of a type of mineralic corticoid. The middle layer is known as the zona fasciculata, and uh, these, uh, instead of being ball-like clusters of cells, the cells are arranged more in a cord-like arrangement. These uh, secrete classes of hormones known as glucocorticoids, and um, the most important example of which in humans is cortisol. Um, and these regulate uh, blood glucose levels, among other things. And finally, the deepest layer uh, is called the zona reticularis. The zona reticularis typically is the most eosinophilic of the three layers, and uh, it secretes gonadocorticoids, um, including androgens. So uh, uh, most uh, androgens in males comes from the testes, but some of it comes from this layer in the adrenal cortex, and uh, uh, females also produce low level of androgens from this level of the uh, uh, adrenal cortex as well. And then finally, this is a section through the pineal gland. The pineal gland uh, consists of a complex arrangement of pinealocytes uh, as well as other cell types. Um, pinealocytes produce the hormone melatonin, which regulates circadian rhythms in, in the body, including uh, rhythms in uh, uh, sleep-wake cycles. Uh, as well as other types of rhythms throughout the body. One of the distinguishing characteristics of uh, adult pineal gland is the presence of these uh, dark crystalline structures, which is called uh, brain sand. Uh, this represents uh, accumulation of uh, calcium deposits over time. So in older adults, there is more of this brain sand present. And uh, this is these uh, crystalline structures are radio opaque. So uh, in older adults, you can actually visualize the pineal gland um, through an x-ray, and which is an important radiological landmark for the center of the brain. So that's it for the endocrine system. And let's take a look at the urinary system. This is an illustration from Netters, which shows the uh, uh, gross anatomy of the kidney. Uh, we're not going to focus on the gross anatomy in lab, but uh, it, in general, there are two major functional components to the kidney. The outer layer is called the cortex, and the inner layer is called the medulla. Note that the medulla is not continuous, but rather uh, it is uh, separated uh, by parts of the cortex which extend uh, inwards and is found in these pyramid-like structures which are called medullary or renal pyramids. The uh, medullary pyramids contain collecting ducts which uh, drain uh, urine that's produced by the functional units of the uh, medulla and cortex. We're going to look at that in a minute. Uh, these collecting ducts empty out into these tube-like structures, which are called minor calyces. Minor calyces fuse to form major calyces, and major calyces fuse to form the renal pelvis, um, which then joins with the ureter to drain urine from the kidneys. So that's the uh, major gross structures of the kidneys. Let's take a look at uh, the uh, microscopic structure organization of the uh, cortex and medulla of the kidneys. The functional filtration unit of the kidney, which can be found both in cortex and medulla, is called the nephron. The nephron consists of several parts. This part right here is known as the renal corpuscle, which contains uh, a capillary bed known as a glomerulus, which is attached to an afferent and efferent arterial. Surrounding the glomerulus is a structure which is known as Bowman's capsule. Bowman's capsule actually has two layers to it. Uh, the inner layer uh, is immediately adjacent to the endothelium of the glomerulus and uh, is composed of specialized cells called podocytes. That forms the inner or visceral layer of Bowman's capsule. The outer layer is called the parietal layer, which is composed of a simple squamous epithelium. Um, you guys have seen that early on in the trimester. Uh, 
at one end of the renal corpuscle, you have this winding uh, or very torturous or convoluted tubule, which is called the proximal convoluted tubule. And uh, that's the structure here shown in blue, where the proximal convoluted tubule attaches to the renal corpuscle is known as the urinary pole. Um, if you follow the proximal convoluted tubule, uh, in the cortex, you'll see that eventually it straightens out and forms this uh, descending, long descending tubule, uh, uh, ends at a loop, and then begins ascending through the medulla again. This loop-like structure is called the loop of Henle. There's a descending limb and an ascending limb where it goes back up. At the end of the ascending limb, when it reaches the cortex, it shown uh, as this winding brown structure here. This is referred to as the distal convoluted tubule. Notice that uh, parts of the loop of Henle uh, are, have a much thinner wall and other parts have a thicker wall. So this is the thin portion of the loop of Henle and this is the thick portion of the loop of Henle. You can find thin and thick portions of the loop of Henle both in the uh, uh, descending and ascending portions. The distal end of the distal convoluted tubule empties out into a structure known as a collecting duct, uh, which helps to drain urine from the, uh, from the kidneys. And so here you can see multiple collecting ducts that are joining together. These collecting ducts are found um, in the cortex as well as in the medulla. In the medulla, they join together, uh, eventually emptying out into the minor calyces. So those are the uh, important structures of the nephron that you need to know. Uh, let's take a look at these structures and uh, actual histological preparations. Here's a low magnification view of uh, the kidney. Here's the uh, outer portion, the cortex here, and uh, you can identify cortex because of the presence of these renal corpuscles. You can also see uh, parts of the medulla known as medullary rays which extend up into the cortex as well. And these are composed mostly of collecting ducts. Here's a little bit higher uh, magnification view of the cortex. Again, you can see the renal 